Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Hardy Stroud Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong and the top stories this hour. Stock investors playing it safe with Asian futures mixed and Wall Street flat. Ten-year Treasury yields falling for the first time in six sessions as an auction draws tepid demand. Arm shares tumbling on a lukewarm revenue forecast, raising concerns that the tech industry's AI spending spree may be slowing. And Xi Jinping lands in Hungary, touting ties with Eastern Europe as a boon for China's economy. We are just getting some breaking news when it comes to the current account balance for South Korea crossing the Bloomberg. We're seeing that number uh, when it comes to the goods trade surplus number for March widening to uh, just under 8.1 billion US dollars. Uh, we are seeing the current account surplus also there widening to 6.931 billion dollars there as well. We have of course seen uh, quite a big move over the past few months when it comes to the yuan. If you break down those numbers we are seeing uh, when it comes to a bit of an increase when it comes to net exports of goods coming through. We've seen a, a decline in manufacturing services, transport as well as travel uh, and a bit of upside for uh, construction and building as well as investment income, particularly when it comes to contribution of equity income. Let's get you to how we're setting up when it comes to the Thursday session here in Asia. This is a picture for futures trading here in Australia. Uh, we're seeing uh, futures are down by just about a quarter of 1%, looking like a pretty mixed start as we have a firmer dollar, uh, a bit of weakness in the yen there. We are seeing broadly the equity session prime for uh, a bit of a mixed open. US stocks kind of ended more or less flat in the Wednesday session. We did have the effect of higher yields supporting the currency there. So expect to see some weakness across Asian FX today. Kiwi stocks are off by about three tenths of one percent in the early part of the session. We're seeing Chicago Nikkei futures uh, looking a little bit softer at this point, Bell. Yeah, Heidi, and also taking a look at how U.S. stocks are coming online and you say softer, that's really the dynamic of Wall Street as well, given we didn't really see too much movement coming through and futures as well, staying pretty steady at this point in time. Uh, we had the, the likes of Tesla, Alphabet, Intel, all of these falling intraday in the session, but Arm is really the one we're tracking after hours. And you were just mentioning there, Heidi, that we had a bit of a tepid forecast coming out from the company. It does really perhaps uh, cast a little bit of doubt over the AI-led or AI-infused enthusiasm we've been continuing to see over the course of this year. So that big drop there that you have in after hours. A 10-year Treasury yields as well, they were just rising a few basis points. Also uh, continuing to assess really the outlook from Fed speakers and, and the outlook for rate hikes or, or, or rate cuts or whatever happens with rates really over the course of this year. But certainly uh, the Boston Fed president, Susan Collins, for instance, is saying that reaching that 2% inflation goal could take uh, quite a bit longer. Take a listen. There's a significant amount of uncertainty around that, uh, that outlook, and the recent data lead me to believe that it's just going to take longer than previously thought. Let's get straight to our first guest, Kyle Rotter, a senior market analyst at Capital.com. And Kyle, where does the Fed really go from here? We know they don't want to cut rates, but at the same time, we haven't really seen much progress on inflation over the course of this year. So what are the options and also what's the market impact from that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as you said, it's very abundantly clear that the Fed doesn't want to have to hike interest rates further. Now, that could be um, a mistake, uh, quite obviously, and, and potentially a sort of bias that's entering into their policy making uh, that isn't considering the balance of risks to inflation. But I sort of see this uh, playing out in three potential ways. You know, basically, the, the strategy at the moment is uh, for, for the Fed to keep policy at what it thinks is restrictive level, ass assumes is restrictive levels, and then just hope the disinflation process plays out. I think increasingly, though, we're running into a situation where we're going back to that uh, old question, and a question that should never have really been um, strayed from too much, is how much damage does the economy have to sustain, in particular the jobless market, uh, the, uh, sorry, the jobs market has to sustain to be able to get inflation back to target. I think that's a much bigger concern and, and is likely to manifest in much higher uh, volatility uh, in the bond market and spill into equities as well over the next few months. The last and very unlikely outcome, which uh, would be obviously very favourable for, 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 for asset prices, is that we start to 
to see a Fed that at least tacitly um, acknowledges that inflation is not going to get back to the 2% target anytime soon and is willing to stomach effectively that 3% rate. Now, of course, we've heard from Fed speakers that that kind of walking away effectively or at least um, deprioritising, if you will, or reprioritising its dual mandate uh, further towards the labour market and away from that 2% inflation target is terribly unlikely. It would be bad for Fed credibility. Um, but it is that sort of final option in terms of how the Fed could play, um, play their cards uh, with the kind of scenario that we've, we've got at hand. I think at the moment, um, again, the Fed is clearly banking on that kind of hope strategy. That hope strategy is probably good for markets as we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But if we continue to see strength coming through in inflation data, Yes, last week's jobs data wasn't very strong, but the economy is still robust. Those trade-offs that, that uh, are inherent in monetary policy, uh, what damage has to be done to the economy to get inflation back to target, uh, will re-emerge, and I suspect that's going to be a driver of market volatility for at least the next few months, probably for the rest of the year. OK, so, yeah, increasingly looking like option two then, as you said. The, I can see that you've got a short right now on US stocks. Yeah, I mean, very, very short term. This, this is, you know, days, weeks, um, if not maybe over the next month or so, and that's really uh, a reflection of our clients and our traders who are very short term in, in, in terms of their thinking. Uh, the, the rationale there, though, has a bit of a bigger picture view, which is to say that really what is sustaining the optimism in equities over the last few weeks, yes, we've seen a bit of a walk back of, of the potential for further rate hikes from the Fed and that being priced into the market. But earnings has, uh, the earnings outlook has, has actually improved. It's a narrow group of stocks that's really driving that. Of course, the tech stocks that have driven this sort of outperformance uh, in Q1 earnings and led to this kind of lift in expectations for not just the, the, the second quarter, but for the full year. Um, but at the moment, if you really look at the, the, the spreads between uh, bonds and, and equities, yield spreads between bonds and equities, they're, they're not particularly favourable, which is effectively to say that assuming we see bond, ra uh, bond yields remaining roughly around where they are, maybe the two-year continues to push towards 5%, that really key element is to try and see a bit of a lift up in earnings expectations, which given uh, the outlook from here uh, and the fact that we've just come to the end of earnings season is looking increasingly unlikely. So we're looking like we're running into that 5200 level on the S&P 500. Again, the yield advantage in equities is fairly narrow. Uh, so in the very short term, this isn't to speak of the fact that the uptrend in equities is still basically intact. It looks like we're sort of look, um, going to uh, see an unwind of that uh, post-Fed post earnings season's relief rally and I think just the risk reward in the very short term looks really reasonably attractive to short uh, either the Nasdaq or uh, in particular the Nasdaq but um, you know even the S&P 500 as well. Carl, we're hearing from Masato Kanda, uh, Japan's currency chief, of course, and we tend to hear from them every morning, but it's interesting the language is slightly different this morning. They said that they're ready for currency intervention at any time. Are we, sorry, my question about the yen is, is sort of twofold. One, do you think there's concern about more currency volatility more broadly and potentially kind of uh, indications of the early parts of a currency war in Asia? And is it surprising that we haven't seen that stronger correlation with the performance in Japanese equities? So first part of the question uh, to, to, to just begin with, I mean, um, clearly the only way that this situation is going to end is if US uh, disinflation, uh, the US disinflation trend continues and we start to see US dollar uh, weakness re-emerge because of rate cuts being priced into the market, or the BOJ, BOJ steps, back into the, uh, steps back into the fold and starts to signal tighter monetary policy because ultimately the yen will be driven by fundamentals uh, and at the moment the fundamentals aren't particularly favourable uh, for, for the Japanese yen. So there's that question. Uh, of whether the um, uh, uh, Ministry of Finance will intervene again. Uh, if it gets close to 160, they probably will. Uh, but they're really just trying to basically um, shock the markets as much as possible and give themselves some time to hopefully uh, see that uh, you know, the prevailing macroeconomic uh, uh, fundamentals start to you know, move in a more favourable direction for them. The second factor, or second part of that question, as you said, is that we haven't really seen a pickup in the Nikkei, uh, uh, Nikkei uh, despite the, the, the yen depreciating quite significantly and remaining around that 155 level. It would seem that financial stability risk is starting to come into the question and also the possibility that maybe even if the Bank of Japan doesn't adjust uh, its key interest rate, uh, that maybe it's going to have a more active stance in trying to uh, guide uh, the 10-year JGB uh, higher, which is obviously negative uh, for uh, uh, valuations in, in Japan, but also ra raises at the margins uh, higher risk for market volatility. I think what we're seeing now is this uncertainty playing out in terms of the currency dynamics, as well as uh, you know, where that sort of 10-year JGB could he head uh, if uh, you know, the, 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 the Bank of Japan has to do something to try and lean against the currency in some way, uh, you know, reflecting in, in, in greater uncertainty in, in risk assets. So that's very much curious. For a while, I've been fairly sceptical about the Nikkei's 
uh, uh, rally. Uh, I was sort of short and wrong on, on that one. But now it really does seem to be the case that um, you know, the uncertainty are prevailing because of these kind of financial dynamics and currency dynamics are really playing out market sentiment uh, and weighing on the Nikkei. We're hearing now from Carter saying that it's not true that officials spoke about intervention. Uh, he's making no comment on whether intervention was conducted. Of course, a lot of Bloomberg's analysis suggesting very strongly that that is what has happened over uh, sort of previous recent sessions. But I wanted to ask about China because I do wonder whether some of the, the pause on the Japanese rally is kind of seeing some redirected flows now into China and Hong Kong. Do you see this? as a fundamental re-rating in terms of the, the, the upside that we're seeing or does that very much depend on further progress on policy and the economy? It's an interesting point about flows because there was that argument that the reason why Japan was performing so well was, you know, capital was coming out of China, both because of, you know, some of the financial stability risks that we saw there, but also obviously because of the changing geopolitical dynamics uh, and some of the structural challenges that maybe China's facing. I suspect that that is less of a factor now just because we are talking about money that uh, is uh, looking to allocate over much longer term time horizons and, and effectively exit China in favour of Japan because of those, you know, longer term uh, trends of decoupling as well as, you know, the, the, the kind of maybe uh, lower trend growth rates that could emerge in China. Uh, the way that I see China at the moment and the rally uh, is sort of threefold. There's the technical sentiment element, uh, there is the financial stability element and then there's macroeconomic fundamentals. Uh, the first two have become very favourable for China and that's because of the fantastic work realistically. At least for now the situation is very fluid and difficult to contain so it could change but the really uh, fantastic work that policymakers did to restore market confidence, uh, ensure that financial stability risks were at least ring fenced for now and and then also probably because of interventions from the, uh, the, the national team, every time we have seen a sell-off in Chinese equities, they've been very quick to jump in and ensure prices are supported, which has restored confidence and again also had that effect of diminishing financial stability risks, uh, at least for now knowing that there's still obviously those major, again, structural concerns uh, about over leverage in some sectors and, and the risk that that poses to the financial system, banking system more broadly. The fundamental question though is still a little bit murky for me and I think what we've really seen is as those financial stability risks and technical factors improve we've seen a very undervalued market price out that kind of uh, discount uh, because of, uh, of, of financial stability risks return to stronger uh, a stronger position in terms of, of, of valuations or, or longer term run averages but we don't have any signal yet that that five percent growth target is achievable or that policymakers really want to get there or, or have the conviction to get there so I'm skeptical about the very long run also because of those structural issues but in the short term this rally could continue because that market confidence has been restored because of the hard work and good work of the policymakers. Carl, always great to chat with you. Carl Brodder, Senior Market Analyst at Capital.com. Coming up a little bit later on Bloomberg Television, HKX CEO Bonnie Chan joins us for her first TV interview since taking the top job in March. That conversation is coming up in The China Show, 9am Hong Kong time. But first, President Biden threatens to hold back further arms shipments to Israel as US unease grows over civilian casualties in Gaza. This is Bloomberg. Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Hungary for the last stop on his European visit, where he's expected to sign more than a dozen agreements with the Beijing-friendly government. Our Ch Chief North Asia Correspondent Stephen Engel is here. And Steve, we saw uh, Xi in, in, in Serbia and there were a number of commercial agreements that were reached there. But is this the point where we really see the ties get reinforced between China and Europe, or Eastern Europe in particular? Yeah, I think so. I mean, his visit to France was, uh, you know, basically cementing those ties with Emmanuel Macron and using the, the, the French visit as a bit of a counterweight against some of the more... Uh, urgent economic issues and political issues that have been pressed by Ursula von der Leyen, the EC president. Uh, and then Serbia was more symbolic and, you know, talking about that uh, NATO bombing, the U.S. NATO bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade 25 years ago uh, and cementing those ties with the Belgrade government. But now this one to Hungary is really going to bring all these issues together where we're expecting Xi and uh, the government of Viktor Orban to sign more than a dozen agreements. Uh, and a lot of them are going to be in the priority industries that Xi Jinping is pushing, the so-called new three, uh, including EVs. Already BYD in December announced 
months. It would build uh, its first European plant in Hungary. It's underway right now. We're expecting possibly another even bigger EV plant to be announced uh, sometime today, assigned with Great Wall Motor. Mm -hmm. We already know that CATL, the big battery maker, also building a big battery plant in eastern Hungary. So clearly, Viktor Orban's government is welcoming Chinese investment with open arms. And he has been also at odds with other European Union leaders, especially over its stance on Russia. He has warm relations with Moscow. Uh, he has open arms on, uh, with, with Chinese investment. There's this Serb, uh, Belgrade to Budapest high-speed rail that is in the midst of being built as well. So again, this is a very strategic strategic move and stop by Xi Jinping, a friendly government in Eastern uh, Europe at a time when the European Union, especially uh, led by Ursula von der Leyen, is really hammering home the overcapacity issues and ex China exporting those cheaper prices and overcapacity into European markets. And, and that conversation with Ursula von der Leyen was, was very full and frank, right, in terms of the overcapacity issue and the implications. Uh, if Beijing doesn't address it, can and is she willing to do anything to allay those concerns? I think the question is, can he do anything at a time when the ch domestic economy in China is slowing and unable to soak up that excess capacity? I think we have a full screen quote from Ursula von der Leyen. Essentially, there it is. Boy, my producer's right on top of things. <laughs> uh, essentially, the, bottom, the end of the, uh, the quote is, uh, well, that's the wrong quote, but that's okay. Um, there was another one about overcapacity. Essentially, she was saying that she wants to see <laughs> China act on the overcapacity issues sooner. Uh, but that's the big problem right now is China has uh, all this excess capacity and it is clear across the uh, industries in green, whether it's solar uh, and also, of course, electric vehicles and that they have to find a way to export it. And that's why we go back again uh, to why Hungary plays a big role. If they're building those plants, obviously, in Hungary, uh, then those eventually will be classified as domestically built products in the EU. They will not necessarily be tariffed under the proposed tariff scheme uh, by the EC right now, upwards of 20 percent. So this is a very strategic move by Xi Jinping. So we're also later today going to get those export numbers Annabelle and Heidi from China uh, expected to pick up a little bit in April from those uh, dismal numbers in March. But again, this all plays into Xi Jinping's strategy of underpinning growth through exports if they can't sell it at home. And that's a political hot potato, obviously, in the United States and in particular in Europe and places like Germany. Our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel there uh, with his Europe visit and of course you know as, as this international charm offensive continues for the Chinese president we're also seeing signs uh, of work being done by Chinese diplomats in terms of the criticism we've seen recently of uh, the US and Western allies approach to dealing with Israel and the conflict in Gaza we heard from a top Chinese diplomat really taking the microphone at the United Nations last week criticizing uh, the supply of, of, of weapons to Israel by the the United States. Re very interesting dynamic in terms of the attempts to sort of try and capitalize perhaps some would say the, the, the international criticism that the US and its allies have faced over supporting Israel and in fact that pressure continues. President Biden saying that he will halt additional shipments of offensive weapons to Israel if it goes ahead with the ground invasion of Rafah. He told CNN that the potential loss of civilian life is quote just wrong. Bloomberg editor Michael Heath joins us now for more. So We've talked a lot about these red lines uh, and what it would take for the United States to be more firm and in fact the, the, the capability that President Biden has to to be able to push harder on Israel. Yeah, I mean, this is a real shot across uh, across the bowels of, of Prime Minister Netanyahu. The US has been you know, reiterating this stance for, for weeks that we've been following it and obviously it really hasn't resonated, I think, with Israelis and, and at the end of the day, this is something that will and, and the US has, has a strong case here. I mean, there's three and a half thousand bombs some of them are really quite big um, ordnance that will cause a lot of damage in built-up areas. So that w what they're talking about here makes a lot of sense. The problem is that the, the fallout and, and um, you know, when you're trying to negotiate a deal with Hamas, which uh, I think Israel is fairly correct in saying it only respects strength, the idea that the US may be, um, you know, 
going to exert enough pressure to stop Israel from going into Rafah, there's not a lot of incentive to then go and make a deal because they, they live to fight another day kind of thing there, which is Israel's point back to the US as well. Uh, but it's a real judgment call here from Biden because obviously there's a lot of people in the US who feel very, very tied to Israel. It's a long-term ally. Uh, and he's, he's got to weigh that sentiment against uh, real unhappiness among, among people on the left. And, and perhaps, I guess, he would suspect middle America that this is just carnage that's going on there. And, and the US does have a, 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 place, a role to play here in, in terms of really pressuring Israel. And munitions are the great one because Israel can't manufacture these things at home. It does have to, it does have to import all that stuff. That's, uh, Israel's strategy has always been to produce what can't be produced elsewhere and just buy the rest on the market. So uh, the West does have some leverage here, particularly the US. Yeah, and Michael, we've heard from a number of top Republican lawmakers who are saying that, that any delay perhaps sends the wrong message here to, to, to its ally Israel, but also, more importantly, to, to possibly embolden Iran and, and Iranian-backed groups. It, it, obviously, it's very nuanced. There's no black and white here. But what weight should we be putting on that argument, do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, Annabelle, they've got a good point here. I mean, you know, you, that you don't want to be showing a gap between the US and Israel at such a sensitive time. I mean, you know, it's only a couple of weeks ago that, that Iran weighed down, uh, rained down a, a whole series of, um, of projectiles and missiles on Israel. Um, and Israel is surrounded by Iranian proxies and, and they're all, you know, looking for a chance to have a go at it. So the, the signal that it sends, I mean, this is, this is the, what we're... we're um, President Biden's experience is really going to have to, he's really going to have to draw on it here because he needs to send that signal to Israel. And he has said, look, American support for Israel is ironclad. It's a signal. It's not a, it's not a we're cutting off. It's not we're going to uh, abandon Israel to the wolves or whatever. But it does depend on, on how it's read in other capitals and uh, among Israel's enemies there as well. Uh, so it is problematic, and the Republicans do have a good point on that. The difficulty for the Republicans is their, their, their international, uh, their foreign policy credibility, which has always been so strong and one of the hallmarks of the party, has sort of been dented over the whole Russia-Ukraine issue and not wanting to provide support there as well. So they, they are a little bit marginalised on that front, but they do make a good point in this case, I think. That was our editor, Michael Heath, there. Thanks very much for your time. We'll have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Some of the tech stories we're tracking this morning and shares of Arm Holdings tumbled in late trading after the firm gave a lukewarm sales forecast for the fiscal year. The chip designer sees sales of $3.8 to $4.1 billion for the period, with analysts predicting sales of just over $4 billion. The forecast raises concerns the tech industry's AI spending spree may be slowing. Official Chinese data suggests Apple's iPhone sales there jumped about 12% in March. It's an early sign of success in efforts to turn around a decline after Apple and its retailers cut prices. The tech giant last week surprised investors by reporting quarterly revenue from China that beat expectations. And you can read more about Apple on today's big, big take, which focuses on who may potentially succeed Tim Cook as CEO. Bloomberg's Mark Ehrman looks at a few names that are emerging as potential successes. You can read that story on the terminal right now, as well as on Bloomberg.com and Business Week. We'll have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. got some breaking data crossing the terminal here. This is Japan wages data for the period of March. Actually, the numbers are really undershooting economist surveys here. So the reading year on year is coming at 0.6% growth. Uh, that was versus the survey for 1.4% growth and actually quite under as well what our Bloomberg economics team had been projecting. That doesn't really bode very well or, or, or meld very well into what we see on real cash earnings basis, given there's actually quite a big contraction there, down 2.5%. Uh, the survey had been for negative 1.4%, and again, a, a worsening from the month prior reading. So not a great outlook here that's coming through for, for wages growth. It's, it's certainly not numbers that the BOJ is really going to be wanting to see at this point in time, uh, given that there had been all of that optimism around uh, wages growth in the country 
Treasury following the successful wage negotiations that concluded earlier this year. Uh, but that's the state of play there. As we said, labour cash earnings very much undershooting economist surveys. Let's uh, keep with Japan now because we've had Toyota numbers as well and the company has issued a, a, a tepid outlook after recent scandals forced it to cut production. That is overshadowing a surge in its hybrid sales that boosted profit last year to a record. For more, let's bring in transport reporter Nicholas Takashi. And Nick, were these the results that, that you expected? Well, in some ways, yes. In other ways, not so much. Um, Toyota recorded a record 5.4 trillion yen in profit during the last fiscal year, which exceeded its own outlook of 4.9. On the other hand, the carmaker's outlook for this fiscal year was 4.3, which fell short of the 5.3 trillion analysts expected. Um, now, Toyota, like other big companies in Japan, is known for under-promising and over-delivering. Uh, for example, last fiscal year, it started off forecasting $3 trillion and then ended up raising that twice to $4.9, and then ended up exceeding that by $500 billion yen yesterday. Um, like you said, hybrids are seeing a, a rebound in demand right now as EVs slump, the, the weak yen. Um, which is a double-edged sword for big companies like Toyota, uh, is, is fluctuating um, increasingly. Um, so how Toyota sort of rides that wave over the next year, even as analysts remain positive, um, is yet to be seen. Nicholas, this was Koji Sato's first fiscal year as CEO at Toyota. What kind of year was it in terms of the performance and the challenges? Well, just like Toyota, Sato's first year in the top job had its highs and lows, maybe more than uh, most executives in this industry, at least new CEOs. On paper, it was a better year for Toyota. Uh, records broken across production and sales. Uh, it was the first time a car maker had made more than 11 million cars in a single year. And share, share prices saw decades-long highs um, throughout, the, throughout the fiscal year. But at the same time, uh, Toyota is recovering from a pair of scandals that emerged in December and January at a pair of its affiliates, Daihatsu and Toyota Industries, which involved a number of um, irregularities and, and manipulated safety data test results, some dating back to the late 80s. Now, Toyota, in response, has promised to dial back production to sort of reassess what it's doing right and what it's doing wrong, what it needs to change and, and what Toyota needs to do to, to revise its business empire. Um, but it, it's still forward-looking in terms of operating income. It's still looking to keep the top spot as the, as the world's best-selling car maker. Uh, yesterday, um, in parallel with that, Toyota's CFO said that they'll have to endure for years in China until they have more battery EVs to offer. Um, obviously, these scandals and the weekend sort of throw a monkey wrench into those promises, but we found out late last month that Toyota is partnering up with China's Tencent to co-develop AI software, and by doing so, uh, it's hoping to shorten that span as much as possible. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm curious about, EVs in more detail, because uh, Toyota as a company and Japanese automakers sort of generally being perceived being a bit slow on EVs. But do you think that those recent steps in that space are going to be enough for, for Toyota? Yeah, I guess that's the main question on, on the mind of not just Toyota as, as sort of a bellwether for the rest of the Japanese in, in, um, economy, but uh, for other major automakers as well. Um, Toyota being the largest car maker in the world is maybe expected in some ways uh, more than others to, to be quicker on this transition. But um, as you know, uh, it, it's not known for that. EV goals uh, have been dialed back in in the last couple of months, uh, not least of all because of the scandals, but also because of higher costs and hesitation on the, the part of customers who are worried about things like, you know, um, the cost of the car, uh, battery range, and whatnot. Just in the last year, um, speaking of Toyota, uh, or speaking of Sato, excuse me, Toyota has put forward a lot of new um, insight on the technology it's developing behind closed doors, uh, solid state batteries and uh, gigacasting, which, which is the sort of marquee uh, technology Tesla uses to punch out EVs um, like toy cars. And so Toyota has, has laid out um, as much as it can or as much as it seems to be able to do uh, a roadmap for, for mass producing EVs by the millions within the next three to six years, um, if, not, if not by the end of the decade. Um, so so they've, they've over-promised, which is uncharacteristic, 
a lot of ways for a Japanese company like Toyota, um, but but they've made an effort to to show us the roadmap forward. All right, that was our transport reporter there, Nicholas Takahashi. Thanks so much for your insights. And sticking with EVs, because a slowdown in demand for such vehicles is pushing many electric vehicle startups to the brink. Two of the largest and most prominent, that's Rivian and Lucid, reported wider-than-expected losses this week, followed by double-digit drops in their share prices. Bloomberg Intelligence says bankruptcies in the sector may start to pick up as a price war squeezes unprofitable companies, Heidi. Uh, let's take a look at how we're setting up when it comes to trading. About to get underway in just about 25 minutes here in uh, Sydney, across Tokyo and Seoul as well. Looking pretty muted and in fact a pretty mixed picture given that we had that flat session uh, ended for Wall Street overnight. Uh, S&P futures uh, when it comes to here in Sydney off by just about a quarter of 1%. Kiwi stocks are actually off the session lows but still softer by about a quarter of 1% there as well. Chicago, uh, I should say Singapore traded Nikkei futures are actually in positive territory at the moment. S&P futures, though, looking still pretty muted. Well, South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol will hold his first news conference in about two years today as he tries to set a new course for his conservative government. Yoon has pledged to overhaul his administration after a stinging defeat in last month's parliamentary elections. Let's bring in our East Asia government editor, John Herskovitz. So, uh, John, what are we expecting today? Well, we're expecting Yoon to uh, lay out what he wants to do for the remaining three years of his term. And also, he's trying to uh, change course for his presidency. He suffered a, a major defeat last month in the election. His uh, ruling party lost seats. The opposition gained seats, has a very solid majority. So he's trying to show that he is a different person, that he can communicate a bit better. And he's using this news conference, which is to mark the uh, his start of the second year in office, to show that he wants to communicate better with the people. John, when you've got the the main opposition party with a large majority in in parliament, what's actually realistic for Yoon to accomplish here? Uh, Yoon is really limited as to what he can do in terms of legislation. The opposition party is not going to go along with many of his initiatives. Like um, he wanted to increase uh, transparency, uh, corporate values, um, get uh, get more tax cuts for businesses. The opposition is looking at things like uh, cash handouts for people. Um, and Yoon's legislative agenda, his pro-business agenda, is pretty much hamstrung. Um, he's going to try to find consensus for things like medical reform, pension reform, and hopefully see if he can find a way to um, end a walkout by trainee doctors that has dragged on for several months. It seems that there's some room for compromise with the oppos main opposition party, and these may be some things that he could realistically accomplish, but his pro-business agenda is has really been derailed by the election. Are we likely to see any change to foreign policy? He's drawn South Korea closer to the US and Japan for security. Uh, at this point, things look like they're going to stay the course with the foreign policy. The, um, the opposition is in favor of rapprochement with North Korea. They're a little bit, uh, they want warmer ties with China. But Yoon is um, going to have a summit that's expected this month with the leaders of Japan and China. And in July, he is thought to have a summit with uh, President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, where they're going to reaffirm the security commitments that they've made. So it looks like he's going to be set pretty much for keeping the course for now for his uh, security arrangements, which are getting closer to the U.S., getting closer to Japan, working on ways to uh, prevent the threats posed by the likes of North Korea. Our East Asia government editor, John Herskovitz, there. We have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. A Sydney apartment described as the most luxurious penthouse in the Southern Hemisphere has just about everything except 
a buyer. After three years on the market, the price tag has just been cut by 10% to still an eye-watering 59 million US dollars. Bloomberg's Buddy Pandey has more on this. And Swati, you got access to this incredible property. So why has it been so hard to find a buyer? Um, look, the property was completed in late 2021, which was post-pandemic period. Uh, we saw Chinese buyers had kind of moved out of Australian luxury property market around 2018, 2019 because of pressure from China on capital flows. And China used to be the number one uh, source country for Australia as far as foreign investment was concerned. And this was everything, but residential real estate was a huge part of the investment. Now they are number four or number five. So we can see that th that amount has dropped drastically. Um, so it's, it's probably the timing, it's probably the fact that we don't have um, as many rich Chinese people who are willing to make that big bet. Um, and also, we only have got uh, Monica to uh, doing this deal the past five months, four or five mm. months now. Um, so they have kind of started doing more uh, of a selling uh, only off late. Yeah, so Adi, stay with us because you mentioned Monica. We're going to bring her in. Uh, this is, of course, uh, going to give us a bit more insight in terms of this market and, and the dynamics that are at play here. Monica, too, is the founder and director of the Black Diamonds Group, and she joins us now from Los Angeles. Monica, always great to see you. And, you know, I, I guess the question is to you, why has this uh, really, in a lot of ways, extraordinary property been on the market for so long? Why has it been hard to find the right buyer? I, I think uh, uh, it's been in the market. Actually, not a true. It's not a really on the market. It, we just open up for the international buyers to come to experience this incredible penthouse. The um, in the, the past few probably years, and the property is not really properly marketed. It's only purely through the database. You are the first actual media to be honest, to expose this property to the world. That's probably the reason. But mainly due to the pandemic, so people are not able to come to enjoy the lifestyle of the Crown. And the Crown, we're sending this amazing penthouse, not just by square meters, it's about lifestyle. If you are not able to travel to experience a lifestyle, obviously it's really hard to sell, but now we're open. So we're op open to all the international buyers. Uh, Monica, you are in Los Angeles at the moment. Uh, is it related to the sale of this property? Are you looking for buyers, American buyers for this property? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, as your guys know, so all the international uh, superstars stay in the Crown. Taylor Swift stayed there during her concert. Now Mark Warburg stayed in the Crown. So this, you know, th you cannot find anything you know, compared to this amazing penthouse. Hopefully, we can find some of the American celebrities to come and enjoy this lifestyle, and hopefully we'll buy it. And uh, Monica, normally when we look at Australian property market, it's mostly dominated by houses, land and house purchases. This is a um, penthouse on the 81st floor. Uh, why, what makes it unique? Why would anybody pay 59 million US dollars when they are not getting land with it? Oh, I think if you want the land, obviously you can buy some amazing houses in Sydney, in Australia, but this is not about buying a land. This is buying a lifestyle. So Crown is actually uh, is an amazing six-star resort. Look at the, you know, the picture now. You have your private pool, you have a tennis court in the middle of the city. So we have 11 bars and restaurants. And some of the movie stars wouldn't name who that is. They stay in the houses. Yes, we do have a gym. <laughs> we do have a swimming pool. But you don't have the service, right? You don't have like 11 bars and restaurants provide you that five-star service and 24 hours concierge. The the reason people will buy the penthouse is definitely because of the lifestyle. Monica, we've spoken to you many times over the past few years, and I know you've built your business really with these ultra high net worth Chinese clients. Can you tell us what does your client book look like at the moment? Is there a big shift away from China? Uh, I wouldn't uh, say it's a big shift. We still have a lot of like a really wealthy 
Chinese clients, and they probably, uh, you know, born in China, live in China, migrant to Australia or other part of the world. And uh, at the moment, we have a lot of attractions from Southeast Asia. So our biggest market will be, you know, my number one buyers are from Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and of course, Singapore is uh, one of the big sources of our clientele. That's actually quite interesting. What are those clients looking for when it comes to Australia? And uh, do you see it as a challenging environment in terms of foreign property investors? I think uh, compared to the rest of the world, I think Australia is still the most uh, desirable destinations for uh, Southeast Asian and Chinese buyers. Uh, the challenge is probably a uh, little bit extra of stamp duty. The otherwise, you know, Australia is probably the safest okay. country and the best best of the best lifestyle for the international buyers. Monica, by when are you expecting to make this sale? By when do you think this property will be sold? As soon as possible. <laughs> Hopefully within a few months. <laughs> so we think 2024, you're confident? I'm, I'm super confident. You know, we in the first quarter, we already <laughs> met our target. And now we, you know, enable to travel around the world to promote Australian properties. Yeah, 100% confident. Monica, you're nothing if not confident. Uh, Monica Tu, founder and director of Black Diamonds Group. They're joining us from Los Angeles and our economics reporter, Spadi Pandey. And you can read more on that story on the Bloomberg. You can also watch us live, catch up on those past conversations with the interactive TV function. You can dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about. You can join in on the conversation as well. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. It's at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Australia's largest bank has announced a 3% decline in the first half profit in its quarterly trading update. Bloomberg's Paul Allen joins us now. So we've seen similar results for Aussie banks over the past week. They've been returning cash to shareholders. Uh, this is also a consecutive decline for CBA as well. Do we see them trying to kind of give that sweetener? as well. Certainly will, wouldn't rule it out and there's plenty of gas in the tank for that kind of thing and they're in the middle of another buyback as well. Uh, they've already completed $250 million worth of a previously announced $1 billion buyback. Uh, but profit pretty resilient versus peers. Unaudited cash profit $2.4 billion. That's about $1.58 billion US. Uh, but that's surplus capital they're carrying. $7.7 .7 billion. That suggests there is scope definitely for another buyback. It's a kind of weird one, Commonwealth Bank. Uh, this is a trading update for the third quarter. They report out of sync with their peers, but in sync uh, with the rest of the market. Um, but the commentary has been very similar to what we've heard from the other banks. And Matt Coman, the CEO, said, uh, look, a lot of households feeling pressure from high inflation, high rates. But he says the fundamentals of the Australian economy are very strong, uh, unemployment's low, and immigration is just a structural tailwind for the economy right now. And then the, the home loan growth, how's that holding up as well for CBA? Yeah, well, in this environment of uh, immigration, uh, the property market's been very, very strong and home loan growth's been, uh, been pretty strong as well, growing on quarter by $4.2 billion. Uh, Commonwealth did say its net interest margin is slightly lower. Didn't specify how much lower, but it has become a lot more aggressive recently on loan writing. And it's lifted bonus payments as well for its top lenders from 50% of base salary to 80%. And that's kind of interesting too, because it wasn't that long ago that we had a royal commission into misconduct in the banking industry in which uh, bonuses were pointed out as being part of the problem here. Uh, but Commonwealth says that increase in bonuses is to stop financial staff from leaving and their top performance going and setting up shop elsewhere. Uh, the other motivation is to try and catch up to Macquarie Bank, who we also heard from in the past week or so, which is really uh, leading in home loans at the moment. I was Paul Allen in Sydney there and taking a look at some other corporate stories we're tracking this morning and Shopify shares tumbled after the Canadian e-commerce company pledged to continue investing in marketing despite the pinch in profits.
The firm sees gross margins in the current period narrowing, a forecast which overshadowed its strong first quarter performance. Its US traded shares saw their biggest intraday decline ever, reflected concerns about future profit margins. Airbnb is providing lackluster guidance for a second consecutive quarter, suggesting growth in travel spending will slow further before the peak summer season kicks in. It sees revenue for the current quarter between $2.6 to $2.7 billion. Airbnb is blaming the earlier timing of the 2024 Easter holiday, as well as currency headwinds. Nomura has joined JP Morgan in limiting dealings with Asian hedge fund giant Sagante, which is facing charges in Hong Kong of insider trading. Sources say Nomura won't add more leverage or new positions to its dealings with Sagante. The fund, its founder Simon Sadler and a former dealer, says they will vigorously defend themselves against the charges, Heidi. Bell, we are watching, of course, for the Bank of Japan summary of opinions just crossing the Bloomberg now. And uh, this is from the April policy meeting. One BOJ member saying that the rate path could be higher than expected uh, than in, in the market. They could also uh, see the need to raise rates appropriately at the right time. The need to deepen talks on rate hike timing was also flagged by one BOJ member. Another saying that consumer spending is a key point. We know, of course, uh, with the weakness that we've seen, and again, there's been a lot of domestic pressures on households and consumer sentiment as well. We are seeing the yen moving, uh, just inching a bit higher against the dollar after the summary of opinions. We've seen earlier today that real wages continuing to show that weakness. Underla the underlying trend is staying solid, uh, but the pay gains are now uh, lagging inflation every month for the last two years, uh, which is going to, you know, Bell, really complicate the, the picture when it comes to how quickly the Bank of Japan can move. Yeah, that's right. Certainly something we're tracking closely and also for trading when we get Japan coming online in a few moments time. SoftBank and chip stocks in focus with Arm giving a lukewarm revenue forecast for the year.